Tá. Fantastic. So if you came here wanting to talk on how to hack drones, this is not it. There's tons of info out there on that, and really, to be honest, you just need some type of spread spectrum radio to interrupt the Wi-Fi signal or the uh, radio signal of a drone to bring it down. It's not a real big deal to hack a drone. And really, when they talk about hacking drones these days, most of the time it's just crashing drones. That's really all you're doing. And, you know, the FAA is actually starting to crack down a lot on drones coming down, which is a good thing because I think they're still trying to figure out where drones live in the world at this point. But this is mainly going to be a talk about if you want to get started in multi-rotors or drones, what do you need to do? Do you want to build? Do you want to buy? What are some of the pain points I've went through over the years? How much money have I lost over the years? Which is great watching a craft fly away with a GoPro and a 400R gimbal strapped to the bottom. It makes you cry a little bit inside. So it's just, you know, those types of lessons. But that's kind of what we're talking about. So um, let's get started. So multi-rotors, fun and hacking. And uh, my name is Ron Foster, so I work for HP Enterprise, soon to be MicroFocus, I think, or it seems like every few months we turn into a new company. I don't know what that's all about, but that's kind of where we are. And uh, I'm a senior security consultant. I break stuff, so that's really my job. So what is the multi-rudder? For this talk, we're going to really talk about UAVs, uh, but, you know, in general, a drone is anything you control. We have little samurai drones of the house that, you know, jump up on couches and you can run them around the neighborhood and they're a blast. We've got quad rotors, we've got hex rotors, we have all kinds of toy robotic things at the house. And if you can control them with a remote, it's a drone. And uh, it's, for me, the insanity is how much things change in six months. When I gave this, you know, talk at Freaknik last year, what, October, six months ago roughly, Literally everything has changed in drones once again in six months. So it's kind of crazy to me how fast everything goes. But um, autonomous versus piloted, this is a Cheerson CX-20. Uh, to me, it's a very popular aircraft because it's Adreno-based. It's dirt cheap. You can have it shipped for China for a couple hundred bucks. And because it's Adreno-based, that means it's the hacker's dream. I mean, you literally plug it into your laptop using software called Mission Planner, and you have access to every parameter on the aircraft. You can do whatever you want to it. And it's... It's a great toy to begin crashing early on, because really drones is about crashing. Um, one thing you're going to notice is, like on this guy, this is one of my home builds, he has a red arm and a yellow arm. That's because it was all white, and then we switched to yellow arms, and then after we crashed it again, then we ran out of yellow arms, and now we have a red arm. And when I break something else, it'll be a red arm also, because it's one of the things about drones is you're going to crash. It's just a fact of life, and you're going to break stuff. So uses, when we look at drones, you know, right now and how they're being used, people think of military, of course. We know that we use drones to, you know, drop things from the sky and make things go boom. That's the standard things that we do. We also use them for surveillance. But in the commercial world, we're using them for survey. Um, we use them for search and rescue. It's a very popular thing. Uh, videography, uh, you know, for a while when the FCC and the FAA and all these people are trying to figure out how all this works, and it was kind of illegal to fly your drone or charge for drone stuff. Say so illegal to fly, but to charge. We would say, well, we're not charging you for the drone flying. We're charging you for the video editing and uh, kind of getting around stuff a little bit there. Agriculture is becoming a very hot thing. If you've ever looked at the SG, uh, the uh, SGI, the uh, 10,000 series aircraft, they're using it for crop dusting now. So literally they can send it up and dust a crop with a drone, and they don't even have to hardly fly it. They can program in waypoints and say, you fly from here to here, here to here, here to here, come back and land yourself. Go. And they just sit back and watch it do its thing. So it's a pretty cool thing. And the uh, aircraft I showed you in the beginning, it will do that as well. It's fully waypoint programmable, you know, a couple hundred bucks, like I said. It's a fantastic toy. And hacking. Sure, we can get a Pringles can and, you know, build ourselves a little cantina, but isn't it more fun to strap a Raspberry Pi with Cali running on it and landing on top of a little two-story building and sit down there with your laptop and, you know, have some fun doing a little net pin? I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, we we don't have to do that, but it's fun. And, you know, if we're going to do what we do, let's make it fun because that's what really life's all about. It's not just about breaking stuff. It's having fun breaking stuff. So when we talk about our drones, payloads is a great thing to look at. So types of multi-rotors. This is a hex rotor. My daughter keeps asking me when I'm going to build an octa-rotor, and I keep telling her when I get more money. 
because going from a hex rotor to octa rotor, I've noticed just purchasing frames unless you want to build them yourself. We're talking a twenty-five dollar, thirty dollar kit to seven hundred, eight hundred dollars just for a frame. So it's it jumps up considerably when you start looking at octa rotors. So we're going to focus on hex rotors. I mean, excuse me, quad rotors mainly for the talk. But this is a, a hex rotor. And one thing you'll notice is when you're flying these things, orientation is a big thing. So that's why I also have the colored arms in the front that lets me know this is the front of the aircraft. So uh, orientation. I don't crash it because I don't know which way is forward and back. It's, it's a bad thing also. So in quad rotors, I love it when I give people rotors or when I, or, or for Christmas and holidays. I'm always the drone guy. I'm always giving people drones. And the first thing they do, especially the little pocket drones, is they'll they'll crash it, they'll knock a rotor off, and they'll just grab something out of the package and stick it on. And then when they turn it on, it goes boop. They're like, "What happened? It's a piece of junk. Why'd you give me this crap?" You know, it's like, well. You probably want to look at that again. When we see each other, when we have coffee or whatever, we'll take a look at it and see what's going on. And the reason why is there's different configurations. There's quad and then there's quad X. We just call them plus or X configurations. And if you notice, there's a green and blue color on the slide. And the reason it is is because one's rotating clockwise and the other's rotating counterclockwise. And you have to have them in the proper pattern or it's not going to fly. So same with these. You'll, if you, you're welcome to come up and look at this after the show, you'll see that the rotors themselves are either pitched this way or pitched this way. And they have to be on in the proper order or it's not going to fly. And usually, you know, when they bring it to me, we just pop the right rotor on. It takes right off. It's not a problem. So when we want to build a multi-rotor, we have to start thinking about parts. And really, the biggest thing you have to think about is weight. Um, Every single thing that you plan on strapping onto this thing has to be weighed. And you have to do that because you have to calculate the thrust of the motors that you want to buy. And there's a little math. It's not complicated. There's some fuzzy math just to get it going. But we do have to purchase our frame. We have to purchase things called ESCs. ESCs are electronic speed controllers. That's these guys here, and I'm a lover of zip types. And I just zip time to the bottom, and those control the speed at which the motors go. So when I push up on the stick, it tells the flight controller to give that thing more juice, and the electronic speed controller feeds the motor more juice. That's all it does. The motors themselves, there are basically two types of motors, a brushed motor and a brushless motor. Of course, a brushed motor has little brushes inside. And if you've ever owned a VW uh, Beetle at any point in your life, I'm, I'm a little older, I've had a few of them. Even when you got hit by a train in one, that's another story for another day. But a, uh, they don't have alternators, they have generators, and inside there are brushes. And your brushes wear out over the time, so you would have to actually go in and replace the brushers on your on your generator. So it's the same thing with the brushed motors. If you buy a brushed motor, be prepared for the brushes to wear out, and you don't really fix those, you just replace them. So instead, people go with brushless motors. These are brushless, and you don't have that problem. The motors last much, much longer. They're also going to be more expensive, but there's so many kits on eBay now to get started with. That's really not an issue. Power distribution. So the next thing is power distribution. Uh, when you come up and look at this, the cool thing I like about these specific kits is the board themselves is basically just a big, you know, already pre-cut board. So you can go in there, you have all your solder points on the board. So when you think of power distribution from the battery, it's all already on here. Otherwise, you can just take wires and build a harness. We have to figure out how to get power from here to all of these motors. So you have to have some type of power distribution frame or unit to do that. And in this case, it's just part of the board. The controller, um, when you come up and look at this as well, there's a tiny little board seated on here. And that's actually the flight controller. We're going to talk in the next couple of slides about different types of flight controllers. Some of my favorite to get started with and some of the most popular as far as in the commercial market. Uh, telemetry. So telemetry is kind of important. It's These days I think it's more important. Um, we've all heard the story. It was on the news everywhere about a year ago about some guy who was flying a, a drone over someone's house. He said, hey, you were looking at my daughter and he took his shotgun he shot it out of the sky. So... Uh, First of all, lots of things have changed since then from a legal standpoint to help prevent that. But one of the things that frustrated me about that case was the guy actually showed up with flight data off of his aircraft. He had the telemetry data off of his aircraft. So he, when the guy said, hey, you were flying at this height and you were hovering, he could say, no, the actual flight logs show I was flying at this distance and at this rate of speed. And the court would not even use it as admissible evidence. So that kind of frustrated me as a drone pilot because I'm like, 
the courts are not on my side, at least at this point, because they won't even look at evidence that's actually flight data coming from my aircraft. But telemetry is an important thing to consider when you're, if you're going to build or even buy, because it may be something to help protect you in the future, because most telemetry systems will record flight data for you. And telemetry for this thing, it's 20 bucks. I mean, the parts are so cheap now, it's not even funny. You could build an aircraft just like this for under $300 now. I mean, the cost has come down so, so much. If you would have said three years ago, and I think when I first did a talk like this, this would have cost me well over $1,000 to build. So it's really insane. RXTX, and we're looking at receivers and transmitters. Even in the last two months, the entire ball game has changed with receivers and transmitters. We used to be ter big Tyrannus fans, and they were all, everyone would like Tyrannus. There were open firmware. You could download tons of different stuff, make them do whatever you want. You could download an Optimus Prime voice and have it talk to you while it was flying. You know, just whatever you wanted to do is cool stuff. But now, because of all the FPV stuff that's beginning to happen, the whole game's changed. And everyone's building new types of controllers that are really adopting the whole FPV type of experience and the controllers, the receivers and transmitters are just dropping in price. A transmitter that three years ago I would have paid four or $500 for, you can buy equivalent now for 80 bucks. So it's just, the cost continues to come down and, you know, the fun factor continues to go up for me. So when looking at controllers, um, I mentioned before about the one aircraft at the beginning. That's using an APM. Now, APMs are an Adreno-based system. They're, they're, they're fantastic. They were made by a company called 3D Robotics, uh, and they produced a drone for a while called the Solo Drone, or the Drone Solo. It was an absolute market nightmare and disaster for them. Uh, they were trying to compete against a company called DJI. And when you go, I mean, you can buy a Phantom drone at Walmart now. We kind of know DJI is kind of like, they're, they're the generic drone company to, to beat. But uh, they marketed this drone. If you didn't know how to tweak it and play with it, it was really not a good drone for you. But because it was Adreno based, you know, for people like me, it was an absolute beautiful piece of creation. I loved it. And because of that, those Adreno controllers can be had on, wall, at, um, on Amazon and even eBay with GPS receivers, telemetry, everything as a kit. $35, $40. And that's pretty much the brains of your multi rudder. And the cool thing about Arduino, a based uh, controllers of that type, is what if I don't want to build a, a copter? What if I want to build a car? What if I want to build a boat? I mean, because we're talking drones, we're talking anything we want to remote control. The cool thing about the Adreno based system, at least at 3D Robotics builds, is when you plug it into your computer using their software called Mission Planner, it says, hey, what do you want to do with this thing? And it gives you options. Do I want to build a car? Do I want to build whatever? You select it and it presets all the variables on the Adreno board with all the preset stuff. And then you just go in and tweak them after the fact. So that way, if I'm driving a car, you know, it's definitely going to be sending the electronic speed controller is going to be sending the speed quite a bit different than if I'm flying a multi rudder. But really cool stuff and a really great place to get started. So NASA. So the NASA controllers are very popular and that's a DJI based controller and uh, you're basically, buy, if you want to build your own Phantom, this is pretty much where you're going to go. Um, personally, I don't buy NASA controllers because just go buy a Phantom. Be done with it. I mean, why, why spend your money buying a controller that, you know, in the beginning they, they had the, uh, they had a, a little multi rotor kit you could buy when the Phantoms were, you know, what I would say overly expensive. But now that, you know, you can get a Phantom 3 Pro with a five kilometer range with full light bridge support for, 699 bucks. That kind of doesn't really make sense to go with a nod. multi Wii. This is actually running on multi Wii. multi Wii is just a really cheap board. You can get them on Hobby King for 15 bucks. Um, there's no bells or whistles. I mean, when you have a multi Wii board, you have to know how to fly your helicopter. You have to know how to fly your multi rotor. There's no GPS. There's no uh, barometric pressure sensors to know how far it is from the ground. You've got to fly it. And personally, I think everyone that really wants to get into drones, that's really where you need to start, is really learning how to fly it. And toys are your are your best option because you don't want to destroy expensive stuff. And there's a lot of cool toy toy grade uh, multi rotors out there. But you know, I would definitely start with toys. Uh, KK2, they're another great, really inexpensive, cheap controller, and they have a little LCD panel built right into them. So you can literally just before you put your top plate on, just do all your programming right there. <laughs> 
have your props off of your motors, test everything out, make sure it's good to go, bolt everything together, go outside to your flight test. And it's a really cheap board. Uh, CC3D, they're in the same vein as MultiWii. Another really inexpensive, you know, $15, $20 flight controller. So uh, receivers and telemetry and the transceivers. Um, Turnigy, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, FR Sky, uh, the Tyrannus, that's a really popular van. And to be honest, most of the guys I know that fly are using FR Sky uh, hardware now. Especially when we start looking at the uh, the whole FPV racing kind of drone circuit that was really starting to take off. Everyone's using FR Sky hardware. It's just uh, they make a little back that really goes on there. You just plug it in, and you can plug in almost any type of you know receiver transmitter setup that you want to build. It's really actually a, a beautiful thing. Uh, then there's really expensive stuff. I mean, I love watching Robot Wars because I'm that guy also. And I always like looking at the controllers they give them, like, you know, there's this really nice hardware. I just don't have $800 to spend on a single controller because I work, I have a family, and, you know, no budget there for that. Um, barometric pressure sensors, I think it's hilarious, and I've got a couple of drones we're going to give away at the Minecraft tournament uh, in there, that I can buy a drone now this big that has a barometric pressure sensor in it. And where barometric pressure sensors are huge in these uh, types of devices, if we're not using GPS, they detect the barometric pressure, and when you buy anything that says it's height hold, all it means is it has a barometric pressure sensor. So it knows when it takes off what the barometric pressure is, and just stay here. So it doesn't mean it's going to drift, you know, left, right, forward, or backwards, but it's going to stay at that altitude, because it knows I'm at this barometric pressure level, and this is where I should be staying. And for 15 bucks, you can now buy pocket drones that have built-in barometric pressure sensors. You hit a button for automatic takeoff, it takes off, it sticks right here. Take your hand off the controller, it's going to stick right here. It makes flying way different than what it was a year ago. GPS, for wanting to do any type of waypoint, any type of return to home, any things of that nature, then GPS are going to be a critical component. Most GPS units now run about $25, $30 if you're buying them separate. And this one has a header on the board. Literally, I just plug it in, go back in, program to use GPS, and then I have GPS at that point. And with this one doesn't have a barometric pressure sensor in it, so it actually doesn't make a lot of sense to put GPS in this thing. This is just my flyer, and I break it all the time. I do it as a demo to show people if you don't know how to fly. And even if you've been flying them for years, a good wind gust comes, and you've got no way to handle that. You've got no electronics, no type of software to handle that. It's just going to crash and burn. So this is my, my base flyer. So we mentioned before about payloads. Cameras are a very popular payload. We have the GoPros and all the other cameras. We have a, a screenshot in the next one of some of the most po the, you know popular cameras that are out there. Hacker payloads, we have our Raspberry Pis, you know, and any other thing you want to strap to the bottom. My daughter was joking one day because I was actually weighing uh, uh, my, uh, what do they call that kit from Hack 5? The pineapple. So I was actually weighing the pineapple and seeing, you know, what's the smallest battery I could put in there to power the thing while I was actually trying to, like, strap it to the bottom of the thing and she was laughing at me. Um, we've probably seen the video online of uh, the guy who straps uh, bottle, uh, uh, rum and candles to the skids and is chasing his buddy down the field. That's my kind of people. Um, we also have the uh, video of the guy who strapped a Glock 19 to his, 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 his multi-rotor. That's a great video. It's also a great way to be visited by the uh, FAA and lots of other organizations that have abbreviations in their names at your house. So I try to not stay away from playing with stuff like that, but not putting it on YouTube. Let's just say that. So. Because, you know, when you're doing your testing, right, you always got to clean out the log files on your way out. That's the most important thing, you know, so it's just, let's not publish that stuff. They already know all your passwords anyways, good old NSA guys. Um, camera payload. So GoPros, uh, you know, what can you say about a GoPro? They're, they're stinking fantastic. They're, it's just some of the best camera hardware out there for what it does. Uh, SJ Cam, if you're looking for a cheapo Chinese knockoff that'll get you almost to a GoPro, SJ Cam's the way to go. I got tons of them, and they're they're actually really good cameras. Uh, Mobius. Now, Mobius is like the most beautiful thing on the planet. Mobius gets you really 80% of GoPro quality, and it's the size of a key fob of the alarm of your car. They're super light. They've made them to hack, so you can actually lose your power. I don't think that. Do you lose me just for a second? It's not like I died. Anyway, so a, um, the cool thing about it is they come with an internal battery. You can literally buy a capacitor for them. 
and hook it straight to your cigarette lighter, and now you have something that's not running off of a battery. It's just feeding the juice off into the capacitor and feeding the camera. And they have like extension modules, the big ribbon cables for the camera, so I can actually remove the camera element, stick it in the front of the thing, and have the body in the rear. This is the ultimate hackable, super lightweight camera. They're just fantastic, and they're less than $100. And that's called the Mobius. For all of our toy grave drones, that's our go-to camera. We don't buy the toy grave drones with the cameras on, and if they do, we take them off. We just, I take rubber bands, just rubber band and Mobius on the bottom with a piece of foam wedge and do my thing. Hacker payloads, well, we have a Raspberry Pis, you know, and I have the big old huge Raspberry Pi in here, but let's be honest, Pi Zero is now the way to go. Uh, with hacker payloads and these things. Beagle boards, uh, you know, any little tiny Adrenos. I got tons of little micro Adrenos now. My problem is, you know, since you can't, you're limited by amount of code you can run on those things because of the addressable memory that's on there. It's how much crap can I fit on this tiny board and make it do stuff on my multi-rotor. That's kind of where I'm at these days. Then we get to the real fun stuff. We get to legal. So, um, this has changed a lot. Uh, this is the model aircraft website, and this is generally all the rules uh, associated with model aircraft. The funny thing is Tennessee, they really are still trying to figure out laws as well. It used to be completely 100% illegal to fly any multi-rotor in any state park. And the laws go back to the old aircraft days of, you know, basically gas alcohol powered airplanes. That's because they were loud, they were noisy, and they didn't want them flying in parks. Well that's not an issue anymore. So why, why are the laws like that? Don't know. But now the law says that you can petition the manager of the state park you're going to participate at, and if they will allow you to fly, you can fly your aircraft now. Which means you still can't fly because I've never been to a state park where they allow you to fly your aircraft. Actually, I'm, I'm a real big, I'm part of an organization called the American Heritage Girls, or a big Girl Scouting kind of organization. And we have this campery in the spring. Matter of fact, ours for this year is this weekend coming up. So it's next Saturday. And last year, I bring two or three drone rigs. I'm like, I want to speak to the park manager. I just want to do some video of this place. It's the closest thing you can get to a refugee camp in Tennessee. And I really want to document that because it's great. Girls going to a place with like two bathrooms and 150 girls. It's the most awesome thing you'll ever see. I mean, it's just incredible. You know, so it's just like, no, you can't fly. I was like, well, is there any type of program? I mean, why, why, why can't I fly? I said, well, you're in a public environment. People might want to be. I was like, the only people that are here are us. The, the, the campers. I can walk around here with my camera and film anybody all I want and it's not an issue. Like, yeah, but you would be doing it from a drone. I was like, I could take the camera and attach it to a pole all over my head, walk through the campground and get some overhead video. Of the, it's still not on a drone. So basically, if I climb a tree and take a picture of my neighbor in his yard, I'm not breaking the law, according to him. But if I put it on a drone and put it at the same height, I'm now a criminal. So the whole mindset of drones and what they're do is going to rapidly change. Uh, I just bought a drone recently called the Unique Breeze. It's marketed as the first selfie drone. It is stinking fantastic. I told my wife, when we go to our vacation this year, we are not taking the whole tripod camera to the beach because you got that obligatory, everyone wears the white shirt and khakis photos when you're on the beach. We're not doing that with the camera this year. The drone's going to do it. And, you know... For 300, 400 bucks, you get a drone that has follow me, orbit mode, shoots 16 megapixel photos, shoots 4K video, stabilized 1080p, full movable, controllable gimbal, and it's this big and fits in your backpack. It's an amazing aircraft. I should, probably should have brought it in. I have it in my vehicle. Um, the Unique Breeze. So Unique is Y-U-N-E-E-C. They are the biggest competitor to DJI. And in my opinion, DJI's customer service is horrible. Come get me, guys, because I know we're recording this. A uh, Unique's customer service is stellar. Uh, I mean, I bought an aircraft from them. The battery was bad the day I got it. They had a battery in me the next day, no questions asked. Uh, I've had problems with DJI products, and they're like, well, after you send us a kidney as a deposit, we'll possibly send you a replacement. And it's, it's just it's a massive night and day difference in customer support. But I, I petition you, if you're going to fly at all, to go to this site. Uh, I kind of did like a kind of a highlight of some of the biggest rules you want to look at, though, if you're going to fly. The big ones, you have to fly below 400 feet. 
Uh, if you buy a Phantom, they're pre-programmed now. They won't go above 400 feet. And if you buy a DJI product, yeah, that's a big negative part of it. We're hackers. I mean, what, what do we want to have over our hardware? Complete control. When you buy a DJI product, you throw that out the window. Because the problem with NASA-based style controllers is they call home. And if they don't call home over a certain period, the aircraft's disabled. And that's just the way it rolls. And they pre-program them to, if you're near an area, say a government area where you're not supposed to fly, an airport, they won't let you take off. Uh, so there's all kinds of pre-programmed rules in the DJI products now. Unique doesn't do that. Another plug for Unique. Um, keep the aircraft within visual line of sight at all times. Yeah, that's another great one. So a, uh, don't, even though my Phantoms will go five kilometers, I can't see it, you know, that far away. And really, it's not a good thing to do anyway. But uh, you have to keep it where you can see it. You have to remain well clear and do not interfere with manned aircraft operations. One of my favorite stories from a year ago is when they had a forest fire and they had the picture of the C-130s carrying the payloads of the flame retardant dropping on the forest and the two drones sitting in the air. The rest of the story was how another C-130 went up and they made him come home because they were afraid it would suck the aircraft into the engines and damage the C-130. When they identified the pilots, they fined them $40,000, divided between two of them, $20,000 apiece, for getting their nice aerial photo of the wildfires. So uh, I'm sure that was a great lesson learned for those guys. So uh, don't fly it near other aircraft. Uh, don't fly within five miles of an airport. Unless you contact the airport control tower before flying, throw that out. Even though that rule says that, it even will stay on the website. It's an incorrect rule. Don't fly in an airport at all. Uh, the only way you can do that is if you become a certified uh, pilot. And it used to, a year ago, when I was looking at this, I said, I want to go full commercial on this. And I told my wife, it's going to be about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. I've actually got to get my pilot's license. And I got She's like, you are crazy. No, your hobby is becoming stupid. No, not happening. Um, so uh, then the FAA comes out with the Part 107 test. So basically the book you would study for your pilot's exam, you still have to learn that book, but you don't have to do anything else. And it's pretty hard. I've actually been going through the book, and I've done some online classes that guarantee you'll pass. And I'm like, whatever. It's For me, I guess because I'm... The more gray that comes in, there's a lot of buffering and caching and, you know, there's page faults and, you know, I've just realized stuff doesn't want to retain the way it used to. But, uh, the part 107 is the way we achieve this now, very inexpensively. We're talking a few hundred bucks for a test. And then you are licensed by the FAA commercially to fly. So you would do just like a real pilot. You would actually fill out your form. So this is great for the state park guys. Oh, I can't take off in your part? Look at my FAA waiver. Mm, fly all you want. Can't do a thing. And the state park guys, what it is, they can't block you from flying in the park. They can block you from taking off in the park. But the problem is, if I'm at a big, huge state park, it's hundreds of miles. I can't take off from the road and go over, as soon as I go over four or five trees, I've lost a line of sight on the aircraft and we've just violated rules. So, there's that. Don't fly no people or stadiums. One of the most horrible stories I heard last year was about the toddler whose neighbor lost control of his aircraft, and it hit the toddler in the eye, and it, the eye's, eye's gone. So a uh, little, little, about the 18 months, two-year-old little girl lost her eye because the neighbor lost control of the drone. That is a horrible freak accident, but that's why you've got to make control, and if you're flying anywhere near people, they make prop guards, and they make them for a reason. And even the little unique breeze you buy, it comes with prop guards in the box. So if you're flying near people, make sure you're using your prop guards. Yes, they add weight. Yes, they reduce your battery time. Yes, all those ugly things, they make me look like I'm a noob. All those things, but you know, they're there for a reason. Don't fly an aircraft that weighs more than 55 pounds. Let me say this, if you can afford an aircraft that weighs 55 pounds, I got lots of projects I want you to fund for me. Because uh, that's some serious money. <laughs> um, and those are, those are your basic rules. And even if we go online and register our aircraft, the rule for that is you have to register any aircraft you build or purchase that weighs over 0.55 pounds. So it weighs over 0.55 pounds, you register it, period. And if you register it, you now get a little FAA card, a little FAA registration number, you stick it on your aircraft, read the rules, they have lots of little rules to go with it. It is now an FAA aircraft. It is considered a registered plane. So if that 
Bubba Redneck guy decides to shoot your aircraft out of there, he just shot down a registered FAA rare aircraft. So now the law is on my side and things have changed a little bit. So uh, in every story I've seen where they've shot an aircraft down, I don't know that they've been registered. Yes, sir. I don't think so uh, that I've seen because I don't think that I've seen because I think we're a lot of those videos were before all this legislation and all this law stuff came into place. So I think that's part of it. And if they have a waiver to fly, they have a waiver to fly. So you know, and if they're if they're a hobby, you know, even a hobby flyer, and it's a place where they legally can fly, it's still not an issue. And like you said, I don't know that any areas where those birds have been harmed. Mostly it's those guys losing lots of really expensive equipment. So a, uh, it's kind of that. But great question. I don't know that I necessarily have an answer for it. So. Can you spook Maybe. Maybe. That'll be one of Eagle's Egg, please. I don't, I don't know. So, uh, right. <laughs> yes. Uh, technically, yeah, yeah. And you're still required to maintain control of your aircraft. I mean, that's just. Well, that brings me to the next line I just brought up, which is, don't be careless or reckless with your unmanned aircraft. Don't ever say, "Hey, Bubba, watch this," or "Hold my beer." Any of these types of things. Yeah, you know. And fly drones. It's, it's just not a good thing to kind of go with. And like you said, you could be fine for endangering people or their aircraft. So yes, absolutely could have sued him, but they also could have been fined. Uh, if he didn't have an FAA waiver to film that event and he would have crashed, he has no way to prove it. No one would have given him insurance. Because, you know, if you have a waiver, you can have insurance. Something happens, you have insurance to protect yourself. But if you are not a registered commercial Part 107 pilot and you don't have insurance set up, you don't have your waiver to prove the FAA allowed me to, to film this event, You've you've got nothing to fall back on. So it's it's all legal stuff, and it's just. They they caught the house on fire. Okay. <laughs> well, I know those little hoverboards. You know, they were for a while they were like menaces, but you know, haven't done that. But that brings us to a point that it's not in my slide deck at all. These lipo batteries are extremely flammable. That's why they say you can't take them on planes unless they're inside of special bags, which are lined with the blood of infants and stuff like that to protect the batteries. And it's just, you know, all types of stuff like that. So, um, somewhat, and also for that reason, you can't fly with your LiPo batteries in baggage. It has to go with you as, as checked baggage. And you have to show them everything's policed up. It's good to go. You know, it's fairly protected. So registration. So we mentioned that everything over a half a pound, it's got to be registered, and this is where you're going to do so. Uh, for a while, they were doing it for five bucks. I think it's twenty-five bucks now. I may be wrong. Maybe a little more than that. But it's, you know, you'll you'll have to register your aircraft. And when you go there and say, hey, what kind of aircraft do you have? They'll give you a list of commercial aircraft that you can purchase, like Phantoms or unique Typhoons or unique Breezes, things of that nature. <laughs> Select your aircraft, give them your money, and. And then you're there. Then from that point on, you have to have that number on your aircraft. You have to have your card with you anytime you fly. So that way, if you are flying at the lake and a park ranger pulls up and he says, hey, what you doing? You can show him your stuff and they'll leave you alone most of the time. So if you do that, put a number on the aircraft, crash it like we know it's going to happen. Can you just build another one? Can you just take the number off of one and put it on another? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's any direction that says you can't. So... And that brings me to, you know, a thing that we'll talk about, you know, of why we're here and also crashing. I have a whole little spiel about crashing. It's not in the slide deck, but it's fun stuff. 
uh, flying restricted airspace, flying near aircraft, near airports, interfering with rescue efforts. We've touched on all those. Those are why we can't have the nice things, and that's why we are here with all this legal mumbo-jumbo to begin with. And it's funny how the talks now become more legal than they are about actual having fun with the aircraft. But that brings us to the Part 107, and here's a couple of links. Uh, you can just Google it, though, and they'll be there. Um, the first is the test study guide. That's actually the, the pilot's book. But, you know, you'll, if you've ever done any type of pilot stuff, if you've ever said, I want to take a two day pilot course, you know, that I got on Groupon, they're going to show you that book, you know, and it's, it's the same book. So you'll have to learn that. And then also, uh, the, the other there is the, uh, the link for not interfering with rescue efforts. So building or buying. Well, there's advantages to both. I have Hobby King on here as my first place. I don't shop at Hobby King anymore because I have actually had to do some chargebacks on some stuff because they just wouldn't refund my money on bad parts. So I actually need to update this slide deck and take that out. Banggood is my place to go. So banggood.com is just stinking awesome. I buy so much hardware from those guys. I mean, my mailman, he, I have no idea what he thinks of me. It's just constant packages coming from China all the time. You know, it's just, he has no clue. Your local hobby store. If you have a local hobby store and you're just starting out, Man, support those local guys. I mean, we, we always want to support local people. And you know what? If you're there and you buy stuff from them and you're first starting out, you got a point to go to and go, you know, I totally screwed this up or I have no clue what I'm doing. Can you hook a brother up? And those guys are absolutely just Jones to help you. I mean, that's really where they're at. And then, uh, you know, just read the manual. So buying versus building. So... The Cheerson CX-20 as of this morning was 179 bucks, And uh, that little gizmo on the bottom is actually my telemetry module, which was 20 bucks. And, you know, so you're talking 200 bucks with telemetry. With telemetry, that means I can hook that to my laptop. And I can have Mission Planner running on my laptop. And I can see live on my laptop's map where the aircraft is. And if it goes down until the battery dies, it's going to continue relaying telemetry data to me. So I can at least go locate my aircraft. And uh, when you build these things also, when you're building yourself, I have this little, little guy right here. You can come look at it. It's just a little alarm. It hooks onto your battery. It tells you the number of cells that are in there. It measures them. And you can set the voltage to say, hey, don't go below a certain voltage. When you detect the voltage is this low, start screaming like an eagle. And it will. It will just start beeping like crazy. And you know, hey, I need to bring my aircraft down because it's going to run out of juice and crash. So that brings me to crashing. That's the end of my slide deck, everyone. So one of the things you'll hear quite a lot about are flyaways. Uh, when the Mavic came out, um, everyone's like, hey, man, you're going to get one of those DJI Mavics? And everyone I knew that bought a Mavic had flyaway problems, where the aircraft would just take off by itself and fly away. And this is always, you know, and, and when you spend like $1,000 on a thing and it just flies away, you die inside every time. I mean, it's just the way it is. <laughs> My first experience was that was, was with the Cheerson CX-20, and I had upgraded and bought a full three-axis gimbal. I had a GoPro Hero 3 Plus attached to the bottom, which cost probably twice as much as the aircraft at that point between the gimbal and the GoPro. And it was it was the, it was a couple of years ago in Nashville when we had the big snowstorm. Everything was white. I was like, oh, I'm going to get this beautiful ice fish. And I live right by the lake in Old Hickory. So I took it up, and I'm flying it. I'm doing my thing. And, you know, it's white. The sky's gray white. The ground is white. Everything's white, and I can't hardly see it anymore. So I flip the come home thing, and it doesn't come home. It goes towards the lake, and it keeps going towards the lake, and it goes over the lake, and then I can't see it anymore. And somewhere in the lake, in Old Hickory Lake, is a GoPro, a Searson CX-20, and a $400 gimbal. So my first foray into DJI's was the standard, and about the same time I bought the standard, I bought some of the DJI professional stuff as well. And I was at a friend's house, and he was like, hey, doesn't this thing have that come home feature? I was like, yeah. He goes, well, I want to see it. So here's the video of, the, of one of the first flights of this uh, aircraft. 
And actually, the thing about it is the video is gorgeous. Uh, here we are on the ground here, little ant people. It amazes me how many insects are still flying around that daggum thing up in the air. It's just, it kind of kills me. So we're flying and we're checking things out. We're just getting the beautiful scenery of the lake. I kind of take it up. We do some little panning shots for this a little bit. You know, it takes, it takes a gorgeous video. It really does. This was uh, 2K. I shot this at 2K, not 4K, but 2K. And this is, this is my neighborhood. So I mean, I'm, I'm right by the lake. And uh, he's like, hey, you know, show me that come home thing. So I did. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So it was about this time I hit the button. Our friend asked to see the come home feature. The home point has been set. So when you take off with the DJI, it'll say, it'll talk to you. It'll say, home point has been set. My suggestion is for using standards, do that a few times. Because if you notice, it's just, it turns this way, which is away from me. That's the lake once again. And it starts flying away. And I'm like trying to get control of it here. That's that jerky thing. It's like, no, nope, I'm not having any of it. So it just starts flying away. It's Saundersville Road. Hey, goodbye. And it keeps flying. And uh, if you see the Saundersville Road, kind of the little bridge there, we're, we're going to just fast forward a little bit. You'll see that bridge again in a second as it flies over it. <laughs> so it's still going towards the bridge. It's just flying backwards. We'll, 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 we'll talk about that. No, because the standards work over Wi-Fi signals for transferring the video, I had zero control. Now, there's that little bridge we were talking about. So it's crossing the road there. It's just going to keep on going. I'm just sitting there. Actually, we're trying to locate which direction it went. We're all kind of hopping a car, seeing if we can find it. But, yeah, it was gone. And the thing is, we were none of us were looking this direction. We thought it went this way, but it was really going this way. So, it's going to keep on flying. And this is beautiful video. I mean, you can go on YouTube sometime. <laughs> check it out. I was like, I was like, this video is just gorgeous. You can see here, we're just, just flying over the lake. So, we've crossed the lake now. We're going to this other neighborhood. It's just beautiful, you know. I didn't even know all those houses were back there, to be honest. I thought it was all wooded, but, you know. Keep on flying here. Now I have no, you know, I have no control over this thing at all. It's just, I have no idea where it's at. I have nothing. It just kind of keeps, keeps on flying. It does this for, you know, this is seven minutes of flying video. Now these batteries are good for about, you know, ten minutes. So um, pretty soon here, it's going to say, you know what? I'm starting to get low on battery. I should probably take care of that. Now, as the video ends, I will say that because it wasn't flying, it did have video, but enough battery to power the camera. I did get about six hours of video of it laying on the ground. <laughs> so it's about now, it's like, hey, you know, I, I really should probably think about landing. And this is really the great thing about DJI. They really, I mean, I can't say enough about how good their software is. It really is excellent software. I may razz them as far as on the being control freaks and poor customer service, but it's just, look at this thing. It's just like gently coming down. I'm like, this is beautiful. And, and watch, as it comes down, I see all these like trees and stuff, and I'm like, it's missing every single tree branch. Look at this. It's like, this is amazing. Look at that. I miss it every single tree branch. This is awesome. Every single, yeah, yeah, uh, but not so much. Very good, good. So. Now, like I said, I have about six hours of that. Now, this brings me to my, uh, my point here. When you're flying these aircraft, one of the things I do on every single one that I fly like this, where I'm taking video or I have the potential to lose and it costs money, on the micro SD card, I put a file that says, read me if found. <laughs> I don't care if you find the aircraft, it's probably in pieces anyway, but I really would like the video of how the heck this happened and where it went and everything else. So anyway, uh, a while later, um, a guy shows up at my door, nine months later to be exact, and um uh, I'm going to close my laptop. I'm done with slides at this point. And nine minutes later, he shows up and he goes, is this you? And he just leaves it and goes. And that was pretty much it. 
after we cleaned all the spiders, bugs, mud, and crud out of it where it's been out, rained on, snowed on, everything for nine months, uh, the battery was fried. We put a new battery in, cleaned it up, put new rotors, new props on it, all that type of stuff. Took right off after I recalibrated it. So my daughter's like, well, you got three more phantoms. Can I have that one? I'm sure. <laughs> so she got her own phantom now. So now she says, buddy, I got a phantom. Yeah. But uh, that's kind of that scenario. And she wanted it purple, so it's the purple phantom. But uh, but the funny thing is, once again, because of DJI's control, after the second flight, it says, I will not take off anymore until you upgrade my firmware. I am nine months out of date on the firmware. So too bad. I'm surprised I got two flights out of it. But what happened to that unit was the IMU failed, in my opinion. So it has an internal magnetic unit. They're very susceptible to magnetic interference, cell phone towers, et cetera, et cetera, Wi-Fi signals, anything. It got freaked out and just lost where it was at and took off. That's So the brand new Phantom 4 Advanced, which was released this week, was when I got the email for it, now has redundant GPSs and redundant IMUs in it. So you get an aircraft with redundant hardware for $13.99. Fantastic. Uh, but myself personally, I'm leaning more towards the unique stuff. I'm almost done with my time. Uh, the Typhoon H, in my opinion, is probably, if you have the money, the aircraft to buy right now. It is a hex rotor. Not only does it have all the cool stuff that you would find in a DJI Phantom, but it also has a separate Intel Atom processor and the Lightbridge technology that Intel has been developing. So if you haven't played with Lightbridge, you can download it for your webcam, for your PC. It's free. It'll do all your eye tracking, face tracking, all that kind of stuff. Well, the Lightbridge technology that we're using, it builds 3D maps. And if you fly the location more than once, it improves the map. It remembers and improves the map. And to fly it, you have a Wii-style controller. You say, take off, up, down, whatever. Follow me. You put it in your pocket, and it builds the map as it flies. It's very intelligent. It will not run into stuff, and it will follow you. And it's a fantastic aircraft. Uh, for 400 bucks, I mentioned before, the Unique Breeze. It will follow you and do all that, and it's $400. It's not quite as fancy as that. It goes in your backpack, and uh, I could bring one of those in in a little bit if you'd like to look at one. Uh, if you want to see it, matter of fact, when we're done here, I'll go out and get it, and I'll be in the Minecraft room if you want to come take a look at it. But that's it, guys. I'm done with my talk. Hey, oh, before we go, I'm, I'm supposed to give stuff away. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to close my eyes and point in an area. And a, uh, if I'm pointing at you, come see me. I have three of these things. Actually, I'm pointing at the guy here in the blue, it looks like, with the glass. Yes, come see me. 